We're constantly told Mother Earth is in trouble. In just the last five years, average temperatures were more than a degree Celsius higher than before industrialization. And I think it's just going to get hotter and hotter and hotter. The reason the mudslides were so bad was because of huge wildfires. More than five and a half billion people could be short of water by the year 2050 due to climate change and pollution. And every time I look at my newsfeed, I see people trying to save the planet. Yeah. Go on, guys. <laughs> We're recycling more than ever. Ditching straws, eating sustainably, and trading gas-guzzling cars for electric ones. There's one campaign after another after another. And in this rush to combat climate change, we're finding innovative new solutions. But wait a minute. Do all these green efforts really make a difference? To find out, I'm traveling, tasting, and testing. Oh. Okay, 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 okay. To discover how impactful these solutions really are. There's so much trash. Uh, In this episode... And my legs are killing me. From seed... And see... So this is actually such a simple solution to overfishing. To our plates. It's gonna be the most socially responsible, guilt-free meal that I can ever eat in my entire life. Eco-dining might be all the rage, but does it really make a difference? Is it time we come clean about green? What kind of prawn is it? What kind of fish is it? Where is your salmon from? What kind of fish is it? Ah. I'm Alex Yu. I'm a millennial which means I spend most of my time doing this. Like most people my age, I love anything trending. And right now, being eco-friendly is the thing. From ditching plastic, to going vegan. And the very latest, eco-dining. Because how we eat is having a terrible impact on our planet. Farming, causes a quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions and 80% of deforestation worldwide. And our love for seafood? It's destroying two thirds of global fish stock. So what is eco-dining? And is it a genuine earth-saving solution? Eco-dining means eating food harvested in a responsible way. From eating sustainably, to going vegan. But do these measures really benefit the environment? I want to try sustainable eating. So, I'm going to start with an initiative from the World Wildlife Fund, or the WWF. According to the WWF, Three out of four of the seafood that we eat in Singapore is actually from unsustainable sources. So, what they did was come up with this handy guide, which lets you know what seafood is recommended. What we can eat occasionally and definitely think twice about. and what we should completely avoid. So, what I'm gonna do for one whole week is challenge myself. I'm gonna follow this guide and only order what's on the recommended list and completely avoid everything here. Okay, so create your own meal. Hi. Hi. Where is the salmon from? Oh, our salmon uh, comes from Chile. From Chile? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Atlantic salmon. Is that considered an Atlantic salmon? Uh, no, it's a farm salmon. It's a farm salmon. Yeah. Oh, God. This is so confusing. Um, 
Oh, well, here it says Atlantic Salmon mm. Farm. Okay, I think it should be fine. So for my first attempt, that was pretty easy. Um, the guy told me that it's 100% farmed Chilean salmon, so it ticks all the boxes. The world eats 140 million tons of seafood every year, and 85% of our fisheries are overtaxed. Fish are being caught faster than they can reproduce. And this is where we get most of it. The Jurong Fishery Port, Singapore's largest fishery. It's 2.30 a.m. right now, and I should really be in bed. But this market is just starting to come alive. Tons of seafood are exchanged here between fishermen and fish merchants, ranging from hawker centers to high-end restaurants. Singaporeans love their fish, and on average, each person eats 22 kilograms of seafood every year. That's 10% above the global average. Whew. These guys are surprisingly heavy. We're looking at 22 kgs of fish, and that's the same amount that an individual Singaporean will consume in a year. But what's worrying isn't the amount, but the type of fish Singaporeans eat. At the fishery, I'm seeing loads of seafood from WWF's list. Like white clams, red grouper, and stingrays. So we aren't just eating lots of fish, but also a lot of unsustainable fish. If we keep eating like this worldwide, experts believe that by 2050, we'll have wiped out our entire fish stock. Jason is the business development director of Kyung Huat Seafood. His best sellers are Batang and Groupers, both listed as Think Twice and Avoid on the WWF Fishing Guide. So the WWF actually tells us to avoid certain fish, such as the batang fish and the red grouper. Do you think this is actually a realistic expectation? I think uh, it's, it's very hard to do that because um, during Chinese New Year, the red grouper will be in very hot demand. So people have their traditional way of eating it. Uh, what I can suggest is maybe reduce or maybe replace this fish when it's off the season. And that's how we can help the ocean. So do you have any other solutions to the problems of overfishing? Is it to eat less fish? No, I would say to ensure the suppliers that we have are all fishing responsibly. So once if I found out my supplier is doing trawling, we will just cut off ties with them. So then what's so bad about trawling? Trawling is a matter where when they are actually casting the whole net down and just grab everything that is in the net. So small fishes die and they are not able to grow and reproduce at the same time. So this is actually killing the oceans. Here's how the bigger boats catch our fish. Some troll by dragging a huge fishing net for miles across the ocean. Others dredge by clawing the ocean bed for delicacies like scallops and oysters. Both methods are extremely damaging and they catch everything from pregnant fish to endangered species. This practice has led to a massive decline in fish populations. After the break, I'm heading to one of the world's largest exporters of fish, Thailand. Yep. Oh, it looks like there's a lot of fish in there. But this thriving industry also boasts some seriously unsustainable practices. Oh, there's, no, there's nothing. Imagine I'm the world. These are fish in the ocean. Every 10 seconds, a new fish gets added to my plate. I eat one every 10 seconds, but I start to get hungry, so I eat one every five seconds, then three, then one. 
Various estimates say the oceans could be fishless by 2050 due to overfishing and pollution. One solution, to eat responsibly. For a week, I'm following WWF's Sustainable Seafood Guide, saying no to fish they tell me to avoid. I've got some Spanish mackerel. I usually buy this, but I checked the seafood guide and it's a think twice, which means I should probably avoid it. I picked up some prawns, and these are definitely on the avoid list, no doubt about it. Um, so I'm gonna have to skip food for this week as well. We've got some mussels. And look, certified. Everything's certified, friend of the sea, very healthy. Hmm, they're on the recommended list, but I don't really eat frozen mussels. I just spent 20 minutes in the supermarket and I'm leaving empty-handed because it was very, very difficult to find things to eat. <sighs> in my quest to explore the chain of sustainable eating, I've traveled to Thailand. It's one of the world's top fish producing nations. With nearly 60,000 boats plying the waters for seafood every day. The majority of boats look like this. And this hardy crew is led by fisherman Sila Wandi. Out in the water they've been trying and trying to catch something for the last hour. Oh, it looks like there's a lot of fish in there. There's fish. How come there's only like two fish? Thai waters are some of the most overfished in the world. 50 years ago, boats would catch 300 kilograms of fish every hour. But today, that number's fallen over 90% to just 18 kilograms. So far this morning, it's been a washout. And I'm seeing just how bad Thailand's overfishing problems are. Over 90% of Thai fishermen are like Sila. They work in small-scale fisheries and depend on this industry for their livelihood. But they're paying a terrible price for years of overfishing. So fishermen like Sila have decided to take matters into their own hands. So then, how is this better for the environment? เพราะคือถามว่ากุ้งปลาเนี่ยเมื่อก่อนไม่มันมันจะไม่มีละตรงเนี้ยอาชีพเล็กๆจะหากินไม่ได้พอเกิดการพอเลี้ยงตรงเ
These farms also act as a fence against big fishing boats. Trawlers can't access this area for fear of getting tangled up in lines of mussels. This system is also helping to protect the local mangroves. Selling these mussels nets Sila's community up to 30,000 US dollars a year. And like Sila, many fishermen are finding redemption in aquaculture, the careful breeding and harvesting of seafood. And their salvation comes from an unexpected hero. The prawn. Thailand is the largest prawn exporter in the world, and over 70% are farmed. Oh. Apirak Changsap is the owner of this prawn farm. For every one kilogram of wild prawn caught by trawlers, six kilograms of bycatch is picked up. Bycatch is unwanted fish, crab, and squid, and is usually thrown back into the water. But few survive. So these prawn farms eliminate the bycatch issue. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, great, thanks. I'm so thirsty. No, 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 no. Oh, oh, they're so small. They're like paperclip size. อันเนี้ยกว่ามันจะกุ้งเนี่ยกว่ามันจะเลี้ยงได้ให้ตัวใหญ่แบบนี้อ๋อเดี๋ยวอันเนี้ยเวลาเราจะเลี้ยงกุ
organic sun-dried apricots. This one has five certificates. When it comes to sustainable seafood labels, there aren't many options. Wild Cod, MSC certified, responsibly sourced. The dominant label is this one from MSC, which stands for the Marine Stewardship Council. This label is given to fisheries that meet strict criteria set by the MSC to reduce overfishing. They claim to be credible and trustworthy. I decided to read up more about the MSC and found some revealing information. In January 2018, 66 organizations and academics wrote a joint letter to the MSC, basically criticizing them for failing to uphold their standards. There's an increasing number of controversial fisheries that have received MSC certification, despite destroying the environment, overfishing, and just generally being unsustainable. Oh, wow. Marina Bay Sands has started using more MSC certified products in their restaurants. So I decided to meet Patrick Calio, the Asia Pacific Regional Director of MSC here. I've recently read a report that basically says the organization isn't really doing enough. Fisheries that have unsustainable practices have been certified. So I want to know what the MSC has to say about this. Well, that's not true. So if it's MSC certified, it is sustainable. So MSC is in between industry and conservation groups. So there's a bit of a push and pull effect. The conservation groups would rather the, the bar be raised much higher, mm -hmm. and industry would rather see that lower as a general rule. Remember, MSC's bar set at a very high level. 50% of fisheries that initially go for a pre-assessment don't go on to achieve MSC certification. And we've got to be careful that we don't set the bar too high to make the MSC program unachievable um, to those fisheries. So then, as a consumer, as a typical consumer, yep. uh, how can I be sure that I'm eating sustainable seafood under the MSC certification? But there's annual surveillance order to check the fishery. Um, so for some of this mean fisheries management agencies are installing cameras on board their vessels. So if you're purchasing a product with the MSC Eco label, you can be assured that every point in the supply chain that has taken ownership of that product so the wholesales, the, the processors, um, right back to the fishery, have a chain of custody and certificate in place. I've received assurances from MSC, but seafood is clearly a fast-moving industry. There are things that can go wrong along the supply chain. And there's always a risk that the fish I'm eating might not be what I think it is. To be sure, I bought all the sustainably certified fish I could find in the supermarket. Eight samples in total. Canned fish, frozen fish, and processed fish, all from sources which claim to be sustainable. And I'm sending all of this to a lab. Will science reveal the truth? Food certifications promise both transparency and high standards. But are they legitimate? To find out, I sent eight samples of sustainably certified fish to the lab to see if they're labeled correctly. After one month, I received the results. Of the eight samples, seven matched, one didn't. An MSC certified product. The packaging says that it was Pacific Cod, but the results say otherwise. The results show that the Pacific Cod was actually Alaskan Pollock. How could this mislabeling happen? And is this Alaskan Pollock sustainable? When I alerted the supplier and the MSC about my findings, all they said was they would investigate the matter. I also contacted the AVA, or the Agri-Food and Veterinary Authority of Singapore. This is their reply. They said that the mislabeling is food fraud. 
And anyone who commits the offence is liable to a fine of 50,000 Singapore dollars and or a two-year jail term. According to advocacy group Oceana, one in five samples of seafood that they tested was actually mislabeled. So I used to trust labels. And now maybe it's time to be a bit more skeptical, especially if they come at a premium. Mislabeling isn't just a seafood issue. I'm heading to Little Farms in Singapore, an eco-grocer that claims to sell an entire range of produce that's good for the environment. Wow, look at this. Atlantic salmon, fresh, natural, and sustainable. Some organic roasted Inca seeds. Certified organic, certified free range. But are there labels telling the truth? As a grocer, how can you guarantee to your consumers that the products are 100% what they say they are? It's a, tr a it's trust and relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and also, if I can just ring up the, the, the supplier and say, you're stating 100% organic of these ingredients, can you please send me over your certs? Uh, and that's fine. The minute they start to hesitate, we just we know there's something going on. So when it comes to products like the fish, um, do they necessarily need that label uh, to, to show that they're eco-friendly eco or uh, sustainable? Or? So you've got Friends of the Sea. Okay. There's, there's another certifying board. Yeah. Um, but if you trust your supplier and we know where it's come from, that's enough for me to serve to my customers. So when I buy an eco-label, it's often a leap of faith. Little Farmer's most popular products are organic. But can we really trust this labelling? Um, being organic does not necessarily mean it's actually pesticide free. It's just actually the way it's been grown. So th these are considered healthier pesticides? Con you can consume it, right? You, you right. actually have it. Okay. You can actually eat it. They are edible. Um, so with organic, it always starts from the actual seed you're using to your farming techniques. It takes a farm three years to actually become certified organic right. from being non-organic. Okay. You've got to take everything out of the ground itself and actually then start compliance. So production company. really ceases? Production three. ceases altogether. Oh, okay. And you've got in Australia, for example, you need to be on a five kilometre radius around you. Mm -hmm. There's got to be no farming around okay. you. It's got to be yeah. clear of any farming. Today, the global organic market is worth over 120 billion US dollars. 40% of the world's organic producers are in Asia. And Thailand has the largest amount of land used for organic farming. This time, I'm traveling to Chiang Mai, where the organic movement is thriving. Backed by government support and growing demand, the amount of organic farmland in Thailand has nearly doubled since 2013. This is where I'll be staying for the next few days. It's a farm stay, a cooking school. This is straight from the farm. It's no chemicals, really healthy, and it tastes like kale, so it should be good for us. An elephant sanctuary, but most importantly, an organic learning center. Wow, I have never fed an elephant before. Satyam Jaikam set up Ryam Gord Organic Center 10 years ago. Ooh, it's ticklish. But he doesn't grow food for sale. And you have to peel the skin for the... Banana. 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 Is there anything about being organic that you still find hard to do? Uh, ในการทํากระเสดอินทรีย์ถ้าเราเข้าแต่ธรรมชาติเนี่ยเค้าก็จะเกิดเกิดเกิดการหมุนเวียนนะครับเรื่องของอินทรีย์วัตถุที่มันมีอยู่เราลดการใช้เคมีเนี่ยพอเร
Yo, these carrots are so fresh. You can still see the soil on them. Oh, organic coffee. What isn't organic in this market? I've got to try it. Has the market always been this bustling and vibrant? Uh, do you think organic is also better for the environment? Yes, because the organic is the seasonal. When you choose the seasonal one, it's the, the better for uh, the, the environment and better for the human as well. Organic food production is buzzing. But is there a shady side to this industry? In 2016, activist King Korn from the Thailand Pesticide Alert Network released a damning report. She revealed 20% of organic products still contained chemical residues. This report made headline news, and now she wants to lobby for certain pesticides to be banned. Do you actually saw that um, organic produce still contains pesticides? We มีหน้าที่รับผิดชอบที่จะตรวจสอบแหล่งต้นทางของการผลิตว่ามันมีคุณภาพสม่ําเสมออย่างที่เคลมหรือไม่นะฮะก็ก็ก็ได้แค่เ
that right? And it's taken them two years to be certified organic. Oh, okay, so I don't miss anything. Okay. Ooh. Oh, it's not too hard. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of 30. Next. Woo! <laughs> I'm done. Without fertilizers to eradicate pests, and make plants grow faster, this natural farm relies on time and effort. No wonder 35 workers here toil seven days a week. So what are we planting today? Okay. And I've been told that they take seven weeks to grow until they're really big lettuce. Through a lot of hard work and manual labor from yours truly, and my legs are killing me. <laughs> so keep in mind, if you ever eat organic lettuce from Thailand, maybe I planted it. So why was it so important for you to get certified organic? What do you mean by fake organic products? โดยการซื้อจากฟาร์มออร์แกนิกต่างๆทีนี้เอ่อเมื่อเค้าเอ่อเมื่อออร์แกนิกมันแพงกว่าบางทีเค้าก็ไปซื้อเอ่อผักที
a lot of people classify your restaurant as farm to table. Right. Yeah. Could you just break that down for me? Yeah, we, we go on farm to table as like supporting local farmers and building a community around the food we're serving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of people come here with the idea that farm to table means like we're like killing pigs out the back and, and okay. serving them at the front or something. But uh, no, our farm's just all veg and everything. Where exactly are your ingredients from then? So we try as much to source uh, locally as we can. And it's all only brought here um, by truck. So we avoid the plane ticket on it. We're like saving a lot of fuel for the like world, I guess, in that sort of format. Okay. Yeah. Um, also no petrochemical pesticides, things like that. So the environmental impact is severely lessened. We're trying to shave like food miles off of our food. So if you're using organic produce in Singapore from the Netherlands, the miles that you're adding on in terms of a plane ticket, in terms of how much energy gets used pretty much equivalates it to a standard product from, from nearby or, or even like a very badly farmed product from nearby because the petrochemical pesticides and everything, you're, you're equivalating it in terms of the plane ticket. So we try and shave that off as much as possible. So we're using as much local product as we can, things that are floated or, or shipped in. Food miles remind us to be conscious of the environmental cost of transporting our produce. But how much difference would reducing our food miles really make? Let's say this represents 100% of the environmental impact of food. All the pollution from the moment the seed is planted until it's eaten. Now, according to an American study, food miles, or the fuel pollution from transport, only takes up this amount, 10%. The rest comes from growing and storing the food. For example, cold rooms that keep food fresh burn a lot of electricity. So, more than knowing how far your food has traveled, you also need to know if it's been grown in an eco-friendly manner. Hi, Alex. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Yeah, come. There's only one way to be sure about how your food is grown. Meet the people who do it. Okay, so this is our farm. This? this yeah, this is, this is our farm. <laughs> it doesn't look like a farm. It looks like a like a water feature. This is one of the most publicly accessible farms in Singapore. On-hand agrarian. There are no fences, and safety officers can spot check the site anytime. You guys are really open and honest about what happens on your farm. For example, I saw a picture of like 300 fish dead in your pond, and you guys just posted it on, on Facebook. Why are you guys so transparent about this kind of stuff? So we do get some people who, who are like, oh, thanks for being open and, and sharing that mm -hmm. this is what happens. And mm -hmm. some people who are quite horrified and like, what's going on yeah. with the fish? Yeah. Um, and you... like, we are fine with losing customers who don't agree with the way we operate. But, right. But we, try, we still try to be as open as possible and mm -hmm. we try to explain what's going on. So the fish died because all of them decided to spawn at the same time, <laughs> using up all the oxygen in the, in the pot. Remember my sustainable seafood guide? It's not gone so well. I'm gonna follow this guide and only order what's on the recommended list and completely avoid everything here. Cod from Japan and Hokkaido scallops, but they're like $78 a packet, and that's just way too expensive. Look, I can't eat any of the fish balls because we have no idea what's in them, where they're from, how that fish is caught. I usually get the Aloha Poke Ball, but oh, what if it's not sustainable? <laughs> they couldn't give me like a definite answer on if it was sustainable or not, or where the fish even came from. I'm done with following the guide because I barely ate any seafood. What I also noticed was that on the recommended list, most of it's expensive food like lobsters and sea cucumber. And to be honest, it's really not that feasible. Here's what I learned from the Sustainable Seafood Challenge. It's cool to be an eco-dining advocate, but it's also a huge challenge. Having a real environmental impact takes a lot of hard work and dedication. My legs are killing me. <sighs> if you want to make real change, 
There is never an easy route. 